Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here on this channel, I'll be doing IGCSE physics content. So I'll be doing past papers, topic questions, and overall revision. So if you're interested in that, make sure to subscribe so you wouldn't miss any future content. So today I will be doing waves. Now waves is one of the biggest topics in IGCSE physics. So first I'll be going through all the things you need to know for that to answer every type of questions and then I'll be going through different past paper questions and how they would like to bring them bring those questions so stay tuned and watch till the end now the first thing you need to know about waves is the definition of a wave so a wave is a transfer of energy without transfer of matter so this is the def definition of a wave Next, we need to look at a wave diagram. So the wave diagram looks like this. And the, the highest point in a wave, so this point, is called a crest. And the lowest point in a wave is called a trough. And the next term is amplitude. So amplitude is a distance between the, this axis. This axis is called the principal axis. The principal axis. And the distance between the principal axis and the trough is called an amplitude. The distance between the crest and the principal axis, this is also called an amplitude. So they're the same. And next, we need to know what a wavelength is. So a wavelength is a distance between two crests or two troughs. So over here, we can see that we have two crests, this one and this one. So this distance is the wavelength. Next, we need to know the equation for a speed of wave. So the speed of wave V is represented by the frequency times the wavelength. So anytime we are asked on passive or on questions to find the speed, this, this is a formula, frequency times the wavelength. Now, there are two types of waves. The first one is transverse waves. So transverse waves, are waves in which that the direction of vibration is opposite or this can also be perpendicular perpendicular to the direction of movement so what we mean by that is let's look at this diagram so the the direction of vibration is going to be up and then down up and down and the movement of the wave is going to be this way. So now this is perpendicular. So the direction of vibration is perpendicular to the direction of movement. One example could be the electromagnetic radiation. So we'll talk more about this later on in the video. The next type of waves is longitudinal wave. Now longitudinal wave, the direction of vibration is parallel to the direction of movement. So the vibration is also f back and forth, and the movement is also forward. So that means they're parallel. So now this is a different diagram. So we also need to understand this diagram. So in this wave diagram, this where the there is high density of molecules, or this part, is called compression. See, on this diagram, all the wave the wave are close to each other so this is called compression and on the other side we can see that these waves are far apart from each other so that means the molecules the density of the molecules is going to be less so this this part of a wave we call refraction refraction and this part we call compression and the wavelength is a distance between two compressions so this, there is one compression and another one. This distance is a wavelength, or it can also be the distance between two refractions. This is also the wavelength. Now let's look at some of the wave properties. So the first wave property is reflection. So reflection is the bouncing back of wave. The bouncing back of a wave. And when we look at reflection, the f 
the first tree is called an incident tree. So this tree is an incident tree. And then we have our surface. So the incident tree bounces off the surface and then we have a reflected ray. And then we have this line called the normal. So this normal line is perpendicular to the surface. So that means this angle over here is going to be 90 degrees. Now this is very important to know when doing some questions. And also this angle, the angle of incidence is equals to the angle of refraction as written here. The angle of incidence is equals to the angle of re re reflection. The next property is called refraction. So refraction is the bending of light. Reflection is the bouncing back. Refraction is bending of light. Of light. But then light or any wave. But light doesn't just bend anyhow. So light or any wave bends when the wave is passing through a different object. So on this diagram, we can see top half of the diagram is air and the bottom half is glass. So when, when the ray is passing from air to glass, the light bends slightly. So the angle between the incident ray and the normal is the, the angle of incidence and the angle between the normal and the refracted ray is angle of refraction. So as we've noticed, the angle of refraction is less than angle of incidence. This is because we're moving from a less dense, which is air, to a more dense place. So that means in this case, the angle of incidence is greater than the angle of refrac refraction. And the next thing we need to know is the refractive index. So it's represented by n, and to calculate it, it's the sine of i or the incidence angle over the sine of r, angle of refraction. You just have to memorize this formula because it comes up a lot in questions. The next one is the critical angle. So the critical angle, we have to know this definition, is the angle of incidence. It's the angle of incident when the refracted ray is along the border or the boundary or the boundary so what we mean by that is it's an angle of incident but then this angle of incident is when the when the refracted ray is along the boundary so we have the incident ray and we have the refracted ray so we can see that the refracted ray is along the boundary. When this happens, this angle of incident is called the critical angle. So what we need to know about the critical angle is once the critical angle is surpassed, what happens is total internal reflection. So let, let's say if we increase this angle, so that we increase this angle slightly. If we increase it slightly, that means there would be no ref refraction so the ray would be totally reflected so we have total internal reflection and then we can also write the refractive index in terms of the critical angle so ref refractive index is going to be one over sine of the critical angle this is the other formula for the refractive index The next thing is ray diagrams. So in most exam questions, they can give you ray diagrams and then they can tell you to complete it and to find out where the image is drawn. So let's say we have an object here, which is an arrow pointing upwards. So there are three rays we can, we can draw. The first one is a horizontal ray until the center of the lens and then it goes down it goes down to the image the second one is a straight line that passes through the center of the mirror the, 
the next one is a line that passes through the focus until it reaches the center of the mirror and then a horizontal line. And where these three lines meet is called is where we have our image. And then we can also be asked to describe the nature of the image. So as, you, as we can see, this image is bigger. It is also inverted and it's also real because we used real lines or real light rays to make up that image. The next property of light is dispersion of light. So dis dispersion of light is basically the splitting of white light when passing through a prism. So when white light passes through a glass prism, it would be split into different colors. So these colors are violet, indigo, blue, green, yellow, orange, and red. We can memorize this using VibGyor. So the first letters, V-I-B-G-Y-O-R, we can memorize this. So violet, ha violet is going to be the lowest one. So whenever we are asked to draw the dispersion of light, violet is going to be down and red is going to be the, the one on top. What we also need to know is that red has the longest wavelength. So it has the longest wavelength and it also has the shortest frequency. And violet has the shortest wav wavelength. And it has high frequency. It would be better to use low frequency instead of the shortest. So red has longest wavelength. So if we were to draw for red, it would be something like this. It has a long wavelength. So the frequency is going to be low. But if we were to draw for violet, it would be something like this. So there is high frequency, but the wavelength is very small compared to red. So on this diagram, it's when we go from red to violet, it's decreasing the wavelength, but increasing the frequency. We just need to know that. Now let's come to the electromagnetic spectrum. So there are different rays, type of rays in the electromagnetic spect spectrum, and we need to know their uses mainly and their wavelength is, or how they differ in wavelength and frequency. So let's start with gamma rays. So gamma rays have the shortest frequency, the low, the, the most, the highest frequency actually, as you can see, and they have the shortest wavelength. And gamma rays are mainly used for medicine to kill cancer cells. That's the, the main use. And the next one is the X-rays. So X-rays, they have a, a slightly longer wavelength and a slightly smaller, lower fre frequency. And X-rays are commonly used to view inside of bodies in hospitals and inside of objects like in airports for checks. And the next one is ultraviolet ray. So ultraviolet, ultraviolet ray is absorbed by the skin and it's also used in fluorescent tubes. So some of the fluorescent tubes or the fluorescent bulbs, they use UV rays. And UV rays are also used for cleaning. So th the rays are used for cleaning and killing bacteria from surface of object. Now, visible lights. So visible lights, we see, it helps us see. So it's also used in cameras and lenses. And it's also used for fiber optic cables. Fiber optic cables. So the next one is infrared. And it's Infrared is always has something to do with heat. So it transmits heat from sun, fires, or radiators. And infrared waves are also used to detect heat signatures. So it, they are used in heat cameras. And they are also used like visible light for fiber optic ca cables. So these are the two rays that are used for fiber optic cables. 
The next one is a microwave. So microwaves are used in microwaves, of course, and they are used for communication. So like telephone communication, like Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, they mainly use microwaves. And radio waves, this ones have the longest wavelength and the lowest, the highest, the lowest frequency. And they are used to pro broadcast radio and television. Therefore, the name radio waves. So as we go from gamma rays to radio waves, the frequency decreases, but the wavelength increases. We just have to know that. So gamma rays have the lowest wavelength, the highest frequency, and radio waves have the high, the longest wavelength, but the lowest frequency. And this, this electromagnetic radiations, their speed in a vacuum is three times 10 to the power of eight meters per second. Now this speed is also the same as the speed of light in air. Now the next one is sound. Sound is one example of a longitudinal wave. Now we've seen this diagram before. We have the compressions here, and then we have the rear fractions here. And this is the wavelength, distance between two compressions. So now we need to know some properties of sound. So the first one is the higher the amplitude, the louder the sound. So the loudness of a sound is determined by the amplitude. The next one is the higher the frequency, the higher the pitch. So when we say high-pitched high sound or low-pitched sound, this fully depends on the frequency. So the, fr the higher the frequency, the, the higher the pitch of the sound. And the next one, sound waves are formed by vibrations. And for sounds to be transmitted, a medium is required. So sound cannot be transmitted through a vacuum. We need air or water or, or a solid. The next one is the audio range for sound for a human ear is from 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. Outside that range, we cannot be able to hear those sounds. And we also need to know the common value for the speed of sound in air, which is 330 meters per second. Now this is way slower than the speed of light. That's why we, see when a lightning th thunderstorm happens, we hear the, so the sound way after we've seen the light, because light is faster than sound. Ultrasound. Ultrasound is a special type of sound in which the frequency is greater than 20,000 hertz. This is exactly outside the range of the human ear, so we won't be able to hear that sound. And it has two main uses. The first one is for medical scanning of soft tissues. So now, like when during pregnancy, the, the doctors use ultrasound to scan and view images of the baby. They won't use x-ray because x-rays are very extreme and they might mutate the tissues or the cells. So they use ultrasound. The next one is measuring the depths of the ocean. So as you can see here, they will release a sound downwards and the sound is reflected back, which is called echo. So the sound comes back again. So the speed of sound in water is 1500 meters per second. So that's a typical speed of sound in water. So we have the speed, the formula for speed, which is speed equals to, since the distance is going forward and then back, it becomes two times the distance over the time. So they would measure the time taken for the sound to come back. And then we can rearrange this formula and it becomes 2D is equals to V times T and divide both sides by two. And this formula would be used to determine the depth of an ocean. So that's all you need to know to tackle the past paper questions. So now I'll be going through some types of question so we can solidify this knowledge. So let's look at the uh, first question. So we have figure 7.1 shows a container of oil. 
array of light shines on the surface of the oil, the refractive index is 1.47. So N is 1.47. On figure 7.1, .1, draw the normal at the point where the ray enters the oil. So the normal is the line perpendicular to the surface. So we just have to draw a perpendicular line from this point. And the next one is the angle X is 56. So we know that this is 56. Calculate the value of the angle, the angle of re refraction. So we can extend the normal. Sorry for my bad drawing. And we know that we have air in here. And air is less than less dense than oil. So this angle should be less. So now we have to find the angle of incidence. This. So to find this, we know that this angle is going to be 90 degrees. So to find the angle of incidence, we can do 90 minus 56. That would give us 34. So this angle is 34. So now we use the formula. Since we have the refractive index, n equals to sine i over sine r. So this would give us, we have 1.47 equals to sine of 34 over sine of r. We can do cross multiplication. So sine of r equals to sine of 34 divided by 1.47. So that would give us, so sine of 34 divided by 1.47, that would give us 0 0.38, and then we can do shift inverse sine, we get 22 degrees. So that's going to be our answer. S state the approximate speed of light in here. So that's, as, as we've seen earlier, that's going to be 3 times 10 to the power of 8 meters per second. Calculate the speed of light in the oil. So now to do this, what we need is we have the refractive index, which is 1.47. And we know that the formula for refractive index is sine i over sine r equals to the refractive index. So the other formula is going to be the speed of light in air. So speed of light in air over speed of light in the medium. In this case, in the oil. That's the other formula for refractive index. So in air, so 1.47 equals to 3 times 10 to the power of 8. And then divided by V. So 1.47 V equals 3 times 10 to the power of 8 over 1.47 over 1.47. And that would give us 2.04 times 10 to the power of 8 meters per second. That's going to be the speed of light in oil. As you can see, the speed light is slower in oil because it's more dense. The next question, figure 6.1 shows a converging lens and an object OX. The focuses of the lens are labeled F. So these are the two focuses. Let me zoom in. On figure 6.1, carefully draw two rays from X which locate the image of the object. Draw the image and label it IY. Measure the distance from IY along the principal axis to the center of the lens. So first we draw two lines. So the first line we can have it, it can go straight horizontally to the center of the lens. And then it would go to the focal point. So a straight line. Let me draw a better line. So this would go straight to the focal point. 
the next line is going to be going straight through the center of the lens. So this might seem impossible to intersect those two lines. These lines are parallel. So this line goes, keeps on going, and this line also keeps on going, but then they would never meet. So we're not going to have the their intersection on this side. So we're not going to have an image on this side. So in this case, what we can do is we can draw imaginary ones. And then this are, we're using rays that do not exist. So we're using non-real rays. So let me draw straight lines. So we have a line continuing this and we have another line continuing this. So now we have this intersection. So this is the image of Y. But this image is not real because this two, these two lines are not real. So in exam situation, we have to use a dotted line. Let me just make sure of that. So we have to use a dotted line to indicate that this race are not real. So now it's asking us to measure the distance of IY along the principal axis to the center of the lens. And so we have to measure this distance. So from here to the center of this lens, this is the distance. Since I don't have a ruler right now, we just have to measure this distance and write the value here. So this value can be four centimeters. State two reasons why the image IY is virtual. So the first and obvious reason could be because this actual race would never meet. So we can write the actual race would never meet. The next one is the image is formed on the same side as the object, which is the left side of the lens. We can write the image is formed on the same side as the object as the object. Let's part B. Figure 6.2 shows a ray of green light passing into, through and out of a glass prism. A ray of blue, blue light is incident on the prism on the same path as the incident ray of the green light. On figure 6.2, draw the path of the blue light through the prism. So now, let's try it from the previous abbreviation we've seen. It's Vibdior. So for this one, an easy way to do it is Vibdior is for a straight up triangle. So when we saw that, we have a line. And then it goes aside and then down. So this is could represent V. But for, let's say, a higher one, which is R, it goes upwards, and then it's always above V. But this one, it's an upside down triangle. So that means we have G and B. So, so the green, this line is for green, and then the one for blue can be drawn above it because it's an upside down triangle. If it was a straight triangle, we would have drawn the B below it. So it would be something like this. So we, ju we just draw it above. And then it goes also that way. So make sure this distance is going wider and wider. This distance. So that's how we can easily draw it. Let's move on to the next question. Figure 4.1 is an incomplete ray diagram showing an object O and converting lens and the principal axis 
the focal points of the lens are each labeled F. So these are the two focal points. So the first question is going to be complete the ray diagrams to draw the image formed by the lens. Label your image I. So now we just have to complete this diagram. Let me just zoom in a bit. And over here, we can see that on this right side, on this right side, the, the two rays won't ever diverge or they won't touch each other. So that means we the image is going to be formed on this side of, on the left side of the mirror. So we just draw a dotted line. And then over here, we also draw a dotted line to show that this image is going to be a virtual image. So they meet somewhere over here. So this is where the image is going to be formed. So we, we have to draw the image. So we just draw the image. And then we label it I. Yeah, that's what we have to do. So we, we can easily get these three marks over here. So part two, three descriptions in the list, clerical three de descriptions in the list which describes the image formed in I. So we know that it's virtual. So it's virtual and it's bigger than the original image O. So it's going to be enlarged and it's going to be upright because it's face, the arrow is facing the same way as the first object. So it's enlarged, upright and virtual. Part B, state the name for the defect of vision that can be co corrected by a diverging, by a converging lens. So that one is going to be long sightedness. Long sightedness. The next question, describe how a converging lens corrects the defect in eye. So how it corrects long sightedness. So first, let's draw a diagram. So previously, without the converging lens, we have the eye over here, and this is the retina. And then we, the eye has its own lens. So now, long sightedness is formed, or it's caused when the, let's say we have an object, O, and this image comes, and then it would be it would be refracted and then but then the image that's formed is behind the retina so the image is behind the retina and if the image is formed behind the retina that means the person cannot see the image has to be formed on the retina so if we have a converging lens in between and we have that lens of the eye so we have an image o so we have it would be refracted over here and also over here. So the image is going to be formed in the retina, somewhere over here. So that's how it fixes the defect. So when writing it, we can say the converging lens reduces the focal length. the focal length length or we can say that it it brings the ray from the image closer before reaching the lens of the eye like over here on the image and the next one is so that the image is formed on the retina formed on the retina We move on to the next one, number five. Two types of electromagnetic radiation are used in glass optical fibers for high-speed broadband. State the type of electromagnetic radiation other than visible light. So they've mentioned one of them, which is used in glass optic fibers. The other one is going to be infrared. Give two reasons why these two types of electromagnetic radiation are used in glass 
optical fibers for high-speed broadband. The first reason is that glass is transparent to visible light and to uh, infrared light and infrared. The second reason is infrared and light they can carry high speed data transmission so they can carry high rates of data or information of data this has a two main reason why this two are used part b the critical angle of a glass in an optical fiber is 45 degrees calculate the refractive index of the glass so refractive index is equals to 1 over sine c in this case it's 1 over sine 45 degrees so the answer is going to be 1.4 so we write 1.4 over here part 2 figure 5.1 shows an optical fiber made of glass so it's made of glass and on figure 5.1 draw carefully a ray of light in the fiber undergoing total internal reflection so total internal reflection happens when the incident the angle of incidence is greater than the critical angle so over here we know that critical angle is 45 degrees so c is 45 so we have to draw the i which is greater than 45. so on the diagram we can draw straight lines this is one of the incident and then it would be ref ref reflected fully and then we have another one and then it would be reflected fully too so now this this angles they all are greater than 45 degrees all of them figure 5.1 shows a block a b c d made of glass that has a refractive index of 1.5 the block has one curved side a b and straight three straight side b c c d and d a so the curved side is a b and the rest are straight so they're right angles at c and d the curved side a p is one quarter of a circumference of a circle that has a center at point p so this is the center of a circle and then this is a quarter circle this one a this section is a quarter circle the first question states what is meant by monochromatic so it's a wave with single wavelength that's the definition of monochromatic explain why the ray of light does not change its direction when it, in it enters the block through side AB so the reason why is this monochromatic light is perpendicular to the tangent at the point where the light enters AB so this is perpendicular so it's passing through the normal line so it's not going to bend anyway so we can say the line or the ray is perpendicular to the point or to the tangent at that point so it's passing through the normal line it's passing through the normal that's our answer. So that the critical angle C 
for glass of refractive index 1.5 is 42. So we know that n is 1 over sine c. So n is 1.5 is equals to 1 over sine c. So it would be 1.5 sine c is equals to 1. So divide both sides by 1.5. So sine c becomes 1 over 1 1.5. So that would give us 0 0.666 and continues. So shift inverse, the sine inverse of that is going to be 41. 0.8 degrees, which is approximately equals to 42 degrees. That's going to be our answer. D. Figure 5.1 shows the angle between the ray of light and line AP is theta, where AP is at right angles to side BC. Let's look at the diagram. So the diagram, AP is at right angles. It's at, let me check. It's at right angles to side BC. So AP is right at right angle to side BC. So this is a 90 degree. So it says angle theta increases to 45 degrees states what happens to the light that strikes so we know that the critical angle is 42 so if it has been exceeded this critical angle all the light ray is going to be reflected back so we can say all the light will be reflected reflected and this is because the the angle has exceeded the critical angle has exceeded the critical angle that's going to be our answer when theta is 45 degrees the reflected light strikes cd so when this is 45 degrees, let me remove everything so it can be more visible. So theta is 45 degrees. And then this light would be fully reflected. So, so it would be reflected to this line CD. And then it asks us, describe what happens when this reflected light strikes CD. So what happens is when you look at the diagram, this would also be fully reflected back. And then we have a normal here. So th this ang angle of reflection for this incident ray becomes the angle of incident for this reflected ray, if that makes sense. So we can write all the light is reflected. So that was the last question. If you have any comments, suggestions, or questions, make sure to drop them down below. And if you've enjoyed the video, make sure to like and subscribe for any upcoming content. And thank you for watching.